What's going on everybody and welcome back to JD TV. I'm your host Josh and we are back for another episode of our series Canadian Men's National Team Abroad where we take a look at all of our Canadians playing abroad and give you guys the update as there's some interesting stories coming out, some players returning from their club break, a certain international retirement we're going to touch on and of course the news on Alfonso Davies guys so if you guys are excited for this series as always this is going to be your update from January 10th to January 17th so be sure to drop a like on today's video drop a sub as well if you're new to the channel and let's get into the update now All right, guys, so to kick start this episode, we're not going to go through our top five players yet. We're going to bring that back probably once all the leagues get back up and running and the majority of our players are, are playing regularly, but we are going to go from country to country. We're going to start in England, and there's not much news to touch on with Richie Larea because, unfortunately, he did not start for Forrest, but Forrest did win. So since Larea has joined Forrest, they have won back-to-back -back matches, they've won in the cup, they've won in the league, so... We're all getting very eager to see Richie Larea get his first start, probably at left wing back for Forrest. But we can move on to a player who did feature, and that was Junior Hoylet. Unfortunately, though, for Junior Hoylet, it was a week probably to forget. As midweek, there was two matches to touch on. He started, played 90 minutes as a left attacking mid in a 4-2-3-1, and Reading lost 7-0. Got absolutely pummeled against Fulham, and Hoylet played as well as anyone probably could have been a 7-0 loss. So we're just going to agree to move on and, and skip to the weekend where things didn't get much better. But Hoylet did start and play 56 minutes before getting subbed off because of a knock, which is unfortunate. He was playing as a right attacking mid in that same 4-2-3-1 setup. And unfortunately, on top of all of that, Reading also lost that match 2-1 to Middlesbrough to sit 21st in the table with an 8-4-13 and 13 record on 22 points, 3 points off relegation places. Things aren't going super well for Hoylet his side, at least. I mean, with the deducted points sitting right around relegations. But the very key thing for us is Hoylet is playing and is playing relatively well for Reading. So hopefully he recovers very quickly and we can move on and get him back for the upcoming January window. Dropping down a league, guys, we're going to go take a look at League One and take a look at our boy Theo Corbiano, who got his moves. Wolves clearly saw that he wasn't getting the minutes he deserved, as well as playing in the position he wanted to at left wing back and right wing back for Wednesday. He got shifted to a side in League One that is above Sheffield Wednesday and MK Dons, and he had his first two matches to get talked on right now, and I'm really excited to touch on them both. In the first one, he started and played 89 minutes as a right wing in a 3-4-3 setup. He played a little bit on the left as well, but primarily played down that right-hand side as MK Dons won 1-0 over Wimbledon. A really good start for Theo, looked confident. Theo had five shots, 59 touches, and a solid 89% pass completion record. On top of that, he created two chances, so clearly showing how much of an impact and how much he was needed down that right-hand side. At the weekend, Theo started as well and played 84 minutes, once again as a right wing on that 3-4-3 record. He looks like a player who just got a new lease on life. And I say that all the time when players get that, that move that they needed, but he did. He looks so much more comfortable. He has, looks like he's having so much more fun playing the game, playing on the wings. And on top of that, your first goal, first goal for the club, you put a beautiful hit like that bar down. You got to love it. Theo looks like he's happy. It looks like he's smiling. And I expect him in the January uh, camp for Team Canada. Sticking with League One, we're going to take a look at Daniel Jebson, who at the weekend started and played 86 minutes as a striker in a 3-4-1-2 system. It was a bit of a quiet night for Jebson, not getting on the score sheet, but Burton did win. They won 3-1 over Gillingham to sit 12th in the table with a 10-5-10 record. On top of that, Daniel Jebson was made the Virtu Motors PFA League One Player of the Month, a very cool accomplishment for a very talented young goal scorer. So big shout out and a big congratulations to Daniel Jebson and hopefully he can get back to goal scoring ways in his next match. Moving on over to Germany now, guys, we're going to take a look at Alfonso Davies, who the most heartbreaking news you could ever have as, as a Canadian men's national team fan, even as a fan of just very talented players, and that's Alfonso Davies. We woke up to the news that he had a bit of a heart concern after his COVID, and it's it was scary, and, and Augsman did recently speak on it and talked about Alfonso Davies, saying that Alfonso Davies will be missing likely four weeks due to his heart muscle inflammation after the corona infection, so... It is scary stuff, it's very disappointing stuff, but football aside, all that matters is Alfonso Davies gets back and gets back healthy. So we wish him a, a speedy recovery, we wish him to take his time and get back and get back to 100% as soon as possible. Always scary when it involves the heart, and we're going to des desperately miss him in the upcoming window, but I know John Herdman and the boys will pick up the slack and show 
Davies that, hey, stay home, rest, get healthy, we got you. So unfortunate news there for Alfonso Davies, and we wish him a very speedy recovery and a lot of love from us Canadian men's national team fans. Moving on over to the Bundesliga 2, guys, we're going to take a look at Scott Kennedy. Not only has the Bundesliga 2 returned, but Scott Kennedy has returned. He started and he played all 90 minutes in a very comfortable 3 nothing win for Young Ragsburg. And it was good. This is exactly what we wanted to see. We know how much important of a player he's going to be for Canada. We need him playing. We need him healthy. And this is a really good return for him. He had a good chance. His defensive partner scored a goal as well. So a perfect return for him. He got his team back into the promotion race, and that's really nothing but smiles coming out of that camp and for Scott Kennedy this week. Moving on over to League One now, guys. We're going to take a look at Jonathan David, whose side Lille took on Marseille at the weekend. It kind of looked, no matter what, like it was going to be a tough one for Jonathan David because we expected Marseille to have a ton of possession being at home and just the style of football that they play. Now, the game didn't get any easier as Benjamin Andre picked up a red card in the first half. So Jonathan David originally started as a striker in a 4-4-2 and then ended up kind of playing as a left mid in a 4-4-1 or a right wing in a 4-2-3. So most of the time he was simply just defending, didn't get a ton of chances. It was one of those matches. But regardless, Lil away from home with 10 men for most of the match was able to get a 1-1 draw, which I think they'll take any single <laughs> every single day. Jocelyn Gormanek will take that. And with that now, the record goes to a 7-8-5 record with 29 points as they sit 10th in the table. So still pretty mediocre, but they are getting better. They haven't lost in in a long time. I mean, if you don't count the penalty shootout loss. But it was one of those weeks where Jonathan David just is what it is. He had to put in a bit of a defensive shift, and they got a pretty valuable point against Marseille, in my opinion. So hopefully David can come back, play a full 90 minutes with uh, 11 men on the pitch, and get himself back on the score sheet. Moving on over to the Netherlands now, we're going to take a look at Charles Andreas Brim and his side Eindhoven, who both the club and the player had an impressive performance over the weekend as Brim started and played 77 minutes as a right wing in a 4-3-3 system. He scored two goals and had a man of the match performance as Eindhoven beat Jong Untrecht 4 nothing to sit 8th in the table with a 10-5-7 record. There's some separation in that last final 8th place promotion spot so it's good to see that Eindhoven are rolling on in and an impressive performance from Brim nonetheless and really good timing as of course World Cup qualifiers are coming on and that's a way to get John Herman's attention. Sticking in the Netherlands we're going to have someone who's going to put their debut here today on Canadian men's national team players abroad and that is Simon Coline who plays for Young PSV he's on loan from the Whitecaps right now he recently just scored a goal in the last match but the the match that was played over the weekend he was able to start and played 85 minutes as a striker in a 4-4-2 as Young PSV won 4-1 over Venlo which was an impressive performance nonetheless he didn't get on the score sheet but was definitely involved in the match and with that Young PSV sit in 10th place with an 8 5 and nine records so they won't be right close to promotion but it's a good way to get his name out there and he he is scoring he's playing well and especially that PSV is is the team that's you know connected to young PSV it's not a bad move whatsoever for our boy Koi line all right guys we're gonna stop in Austria now for just a quick little update on Gloria Amanda as the Austrian Bundesliga has not started yet but Gloria Amanda was able to play a little friendly matchup and Gloria Amanda on top of that found the back of the net for Austria Klagenfurt as the team got 2022 underway with a big 7-1 victory so it was good to see Amanda score he doesn't get to start a lot for Austria Klagenfurt usually comes on the off the bench and honestly usually comes off the bench in the 85th plus minute so he doesn't get a ton of minutes he does score a couple goals and so it's nice to get see him get one once again and hopefully we can see him break into the starting 11 once the Austrian Bundesliga kicks back off. All right, guys, moving on over to Belgium now. We're going to take a look at Tejan Buchanan, who officially played his first match for Club Bruges. He started and played all 90 minutes as a left wing back in a 3-5-2 system. I was a little skeptical about left wing back, but I've seen him play well there before. And and he he played decent for his first match. Club Bruges did win 2-0, which got them to still sit second in the table with a 12-7-3 record on 43 points. But there's a lot more to dig in here. With with Paul Clement moving on over to Monaco, a new manager was brought in. This was a good opportunity for Tejan Buchanan to come in because, like I've kind of stressed before, if you came in when Paul Clement was still in here, you had to break into an already structured side. But with a new manager coming in, not only are all the players new, but Tejan's new. And he started and played all 90 minutes, which was really positive to see. Now, the ball didn't get put down the left-hand side a ton. It was mostly and primarily played down the right. But regardless, Tejan was still involved. He still tried taking players on 1v1. 
I think that he's going to definitely grow into this team and the manager showed confidence by allowing him to play all 90 minutes. So it was, it was a decent little debut for Tejon Buchanan, but I'm expecting him to get a lot more involved when he gets a little bit more comfortable with Club Bruges and this league. Moving on over to EK Ugbo and his side, Genk, who, I mean, like Club Bruges, got back to winning ways. Ugbo started and played 89 minutes as a striker in a 4-3-3 setup. Genk won 4-1. Ugbo was very active throughout the match. He was creating chances, but he also missed three big opportunities and not scoring a goal, which is not really what you want to see, knowing that he's got big striker competition. We'd like to see Ugbo get off, but no harm, no foul was with that big win. Genk now move up to seventh place, back in European places with a 9-5-8 record. We're really excited and really hyped to see EK potentially start and play a match for the Cayman's national team in the upcoming window. Everyone knows that he's a good back to goal striper, a true number nine. So we really want to see him get his scoring streak. We don't like seeing those three big misses, but either way, regardless, his side got the three points and ultimately that's all that matters and, and, a, and a decent little week there for EK Ubo. All right, guys, moving on over to Greece now. We're going to take a look at Derek Cornelius and his side, Panathinaikos, who had two very difficult matchups, one midweek and one at the weekend. The first one midweek was against Pauk, who's towards the top of the table. Cornelius did start that match. He played all 90 minutes as a left back in a 4-2-3-1, but unfortunately, they lost 2 nothing. I'm not a big fan of seeing Cornelius play as a left back in a back four. Last time he did that, I believe he got yanked off in the 59th minute. He's much, much better and much more comfortable playing as a center back or even an outside left center back in a back three and that was fixed because midweek disappointing result but against a tough team they had to follow that up on the weekend against AEK Athens another team towards the top of the table and Pantognikos won 2-1 and Cornelius started and played all 90 minutes as a center back in a 4-2-3-1 and that's a really impressive performance really impressive win over Athens and with that win they now sit with a 5-3 and 9 record ninth in the table really excited to see Cornelius I've been a fan since his moves to Greece and with performances like this I'm hoping that potentially he starts one or two games in the upcoming window all right, guys, moving on over to Portugal now. We're going to take a look at Steven Vittoria and his side, Moriense, who had a tough challenge taking on Benfica. And on top of that, they swapped out their manager. Ricardo Sapinto is the new manager of Moriense and not really your preferred start to take on Benfica. But regardless, had a very impressive performance as Steven Vittoria started in that match, played all 90 minutes as a central center back in a 3-4-3 system as Moriense drew Benfica 1-1. With that result, they sit 14th in the table with a 3-7-8 record. We got a little in-depth information as well from Adrian from Rabona TV, so big shout out, who is a big Benfica fan and watched the match. Basically said what you would expect. Benfica took the game to Morance. They sat very deep, had to do a lot of defending. He's, he really praised Vittoria and said that he had a really good matchup at the heart of that center back. Wearing the captain's armband, being the leader back there, organized the back line well, had to deal with a lot of balls coming in, and ultimately getting a result against Benfica like this when you're towards 15th in the table is a perfect result for Vittoria, perfect result for the new manager as well as Morianse. So a lot of smiles coming out of that camp as they are obviously trying to avoid relegation. Heading on over now to Passos de Ferreira and Stefan Ustakio, whose side had a tricky little challenge over the weekend. Steph did start in that match, played all 90 minutes as a CDM in a 4-2-3-1 setup as Passos drew nil-nil. With that result, they sit 11th in the table with a 4-6-8 record. But that's not the big news coming out of this camp as it was a good performance by Steph. We Probably one of the better players on the pitch, which you know we, we, we expect. Uh, but he has been linked once again to Porto. So you guys have heard me theorize around this, saying that Oliveira got moved over to AS Roma on a loan. There's an opening now in that midfield. There's a chance that Steph was linked there before. He'd be linked there again. And there was actually a couple of rumors coming back out that Eustachio is linked with a loan move to Porto, which makes sense. Bring him on loan, see what he can do. Get, hopefully he plays, which is a bit of a concern. But I just think he needs this move because it, it seems like forever he's the one who's been left in the in the dirt. He needs to find a way to get out of Passos. I'm sorry. I know that they're holding for a high transfer value for him, but he needs to make it work. And I think the next logical step really is Porto. So the fact that Oliveira went over and who scored, by the way, so there's a good chance that he could get a permanent move over to Roma at the weekend, opens up a spot for you, stack you, bring him on loan, let him impress, let him do what he does, and hopefully sign him permanently. So we'll have to wait and see how it goes. We always have our fingers crossed. Never seems to work out, but we'll just have to wait and see. But it was a good performance for Eustachio at the weekend once again. 
All right, guys, moving on over to Scotland now, we're going to take a look at Scott Arfield. And he's the only player we're going to take a look at because, well, the Scottish League is still on their break, but there's some big news coming from Scott Arfield's camp as he's officially announced that he's retired from international football. A lot of us were wondering whether he'd actually come back in for this upcoming window, and we've got our answer. And this is what Scott Arfield had to say via his Instagram. It's with a heavy heart that the time has come to officially announce my retirement from the Canadian men's national team. I have loved every minute representing Canada. I am extremely grateful for the opportunities and experiences I have been given both on and off the pitch. From day one in the program, I have stated that this team under the right guidance will fully reach their potential and I'm proud to see it coming to fruition. I have a fantastic relationship with John Herdman and I want to thank him for trusting and giving me the honor to captain the team in the early days as manager. Thanks to every staff member, every supporter, and every teammate along the way. I'm desperate to see the boys get to Qatar and let the world see what a fantastic place Canadian soccer is in. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Very surprising words coming from Scott Arfield as he's playing right now for Rangers, playing well, playing at a competitive level. It kind of seemed like there was a route back in. I'm not going to theorize around why this decision came in because I know that there's a lot of rumors going out there, but it is what it is. So I just have a question for you guys. Do you want me to continue covering Scott Arfield? I mean, he is Canadian. He will never play for the Canadian national team again, but I don't, don't really have the situation. So let me know in the comments down below now, guys. Do you want me to continue with updates on Scott Arfield or do you want me to remove him from my list? All right, guys, moving over to Serbia now. There's no matches to touch on. They're still on their break as well. But since the last time we had our update, Milan Borian has got COVID and recovered from it. So just letting everyone know that he's recovered fully from COVID, which is good to see and is obviously expected to be at the upcoming Canada camp. All right, guys, moving on over to the Turkey now. We're going to take a look at Besiktas and the Besiktas boys. The first one, Hutch, he did not feature in the match at the weekend. And Kyle Lahren was subbed on on the 60th minute. He was subbed on to play as a left mid in a 4-1-4-1 system as Besiktas won 1-0 to move up to 7th in the table with a 9-5-7 record. A solid win gets them closer to those European places, which they are obviously desperate to get after this somewhat mediocre season. Laren wasn't overly impactful, but expecting to probably start the next match and hopefully find his way back on the score sheet as he did score a goal, but it was just ruled out. Moving on over now to Sam Adekudvi and his side, Hasso Sporer, who had a very impressive win. Honestly, maybe even a historic win, but we'll get into that in a sec. As Adekubi started and played 90 minutes as a left back in a 4-4-2 system, as Hataspor beat Galatasaray 4-2. Sam was somewhat quiet, but he got the job done and needed to do what he did in a wild match as Hataspor now sit third in the table with an 11-2-8 record, really overachieving. Adekubi still being solid once again, and it, it is historic because Galatasaray are a huge team in Turkey, but Let's be honest, they, they're a shadow of what they usually are, and they're having a dreadful, dreadful campaign. But regardless, it is still a big victory. A couple penalties helped that decision, but Hattasport picked up big three points, and Adekubi hopefully getting that match fitness that we need because we're going to need him in the upcoming window. All right, guys, the final update for today is Easton Onger and his move to Romania. Uterad, who we know picked him up, is an impressive move. He had an exceptional season for Edmonton in the CPL. Really excited for him, and he was able to feature as Angero took the pitch for the very first time, and he entered in the second half in a 2-1 loss in, in a friendly. So really excited to see him get on the pitch. It was a cool move. This is a, kind of what we want to see out of the CPL, getting the young players who shine European interest. And moving to Romania is very, very cool. I'm excited to see what kind of future he has in store. All right, guys, that brings us to an end of this episode of our Canadian Men's National Team, a broad episode. It was a fun one. It was an interesting one, a lot of cool storylines. And let me know in the comments below, specifically, guys, if you want to see Eustachio join Porto, because I know a lot of people have even said, no, playtime, it's an issue. So I'm just curious to see what you guys have to say. And of course, let me know on Scott Arfield if you want me to keep co covering him. And what do you think led him to this decision? Very curious, guys. And hopefully you guys did enjoy this. And one final time, be sure to drop a like on your way out. Drop a sub as well if you guys are new. And we'll see you guys next time. Cheers, friends.